Yeah. Yeah, I actually probably need to this week. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you today, at least through the magic of cyberspace. How's everybody doing? Good? All right. Good deal. Well, we've got a lot to cover today with uh we've got three quarters of the book of genesis we've taken a couple weeks three weeks to do the first uh quarter of genesis and the next chapter covers the the other three quarters so we'll go ahead and uh dive in but first wanted to see if there are any questions or uh, concerns or things front loaded before we before i dive in so of yep. course yeah so i so i noticed a note on page 64 where it talks to the beginning where uh the j source of genesis 12 through 50 where it quotes uh actually god's blessing upon abram i will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you i will curse you blah 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 that's a that's a that's a formula that's used you know, of course regularly in genesis I just I realized yesterday I was reading the uh, Isaac's blessing on the false Esau, and in that instead of God saying, "I will bless those who bless you," it's it's Isaac saying, "Curse everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee." Uh huh. Which is I find that I just find that interesting. It's a shift from God down to Isaac, and then. Of course, in the old te in the New Testament, it reminds me of, of the of the injunction Christ gives to the disciples, you know, that all you blessed will be blessed in heaven, and all you cursed will be cursed in heaven. It's it's just something that I picked up on. I, was asking, I, I had never noticed that, Bob, but you're right. I'm looking at Genesis 27 right now, and yeah. Uh, so Isaac Isaac and God use similar similar language, but uh, you know, similar blessing prayers. So that's 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 fascinating. Uh, good good catch. Good catch. Other anything else? That, that's that's awesome. Ah, almost dropped my coke there. Mountain Dew. All right. Well, cool. Well, if these things come up, we can uh, we can pause and talk about them. But I, I keep saying I'm going to stop doing powerpoints, but uh, then I need to decide to do a powerpoint. So. Uh, one of these days I may not have a PowerPoint for you, so don't get used to it, but uh, I am going to use one pretty extensively today. So let's share that. I'm assuming everybody can see that. Good. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, we do have a, a big, uh, big chunk of Genesis today, so we'll dive in. Um, this section of Genesis 12 through 50 really deals with the patriarchs and to a lesser extent Extent the matriarchs. We've got Abraham and Sarah, plus we've also got uh, Hagar, and uh, then there's a brief mention of Keturah, Abraham's uh, wife after Sarah dies, that really kind of a glancing mention right at the end. So uh, it's actually a good Bible trivia question. Who's Abraham's uh, last wife? Uh, Keturah. Uh, nobody ever talks about Keturah, but uh, so we've got Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, uh, Jacob with his two wives, Rachel and Leah, who are sisters. Uh, and then uh, the, the 12 sons. So really kind of four generations is what's focused on in the last section of Genesis. Uh, the, the text had uh, the family tree. Uh, they missed one important dotted line, and so I added that in. Uh, you know, Rebecca and Isaac are, are married as well. Uh, if you look at this and say the family tree doesn't fork very much, uh, that's true. People are marrying their cousins, their first cousins, all over the place. Uh, that's you know, the way these, these clans work. Um, and in many states, that's still legal today, so you can marry your first cousin. So, uh, but Isaac, Isaac and Rebecca, uh, that that line should have been included there, in my humble opinion. So I, I stuck it in to that that uh, thing. But if you, if you look at those generations, Terah's the the top ancestor, but then he's got Abraham, and uh, you know, Abraham has Abraham's left you not left you not Abraham's nephew Lot figures in uh, to the story early on, uh, his son Isaac, Rebecca, uh, Ishmael, you've got uh, Jacob and Esau, you've got uh, Rebecca and her brother Laban, Laban will figure in, Laban has, Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel, 
and their maids also figure in and 12 sons, uh, 12 tribes of Israel uh, here, plus a couple of uh, sons of Joseph. So it's in your book. If you, ever want to, if you ever get confused by the family tree here, that's it's a pretty good document uh, diagram, except for needing that marriage link between Isaac and Rebecca. Jim? I, yes, please. Uh, who? Uh, Becky and I came in late. Uh, we just got here. Who is Tara? Is that Adam? No, Tara. Tara is Abraham's uh, dad. So he he shows up in the in the eleventh chapter of Genesis, uh, and it talks about him moving his family from Ur of the Chaldees up to up to uh, Haran. Uh, so going from I'll, I'll I'll pull the map up in a second. It goes from uh, basically southeast Iraq to northwest Iraq. Uh, or almost into Syria on, on our maps. So kind of up in that borderline between Iraq and Syria. Well, let me, I can just, let me just jump to the map. I can go, where's the map at? Yeah. So, um, you know, Haran's up here. Uh, Ur is down here uh, and Israel, Egypt. So Haran is the kind of the, the patriarch we don't talk about much because really the story shifts to Abraham uh, pretty quick. We have these these four generations here, and we do say patriarchs and matriarchs. Uh, it is remarkable in a very patriarchal culture, which it was at the time, that the women are even mentioned. Uh, feminist scholars today might say it might be nice to have a little more mention of the women, but they also hold up and lift up how important these women are in the Genesis narrative, in a culture that usually discounts women. And so they're not the main actors by any means. Really, the main actors are, are the guys in these stories. But we don't want to forget that these matriarchs do pop up a lot more than they would in the culture. And so it, it really is kind of an amazing, amazing thing from that standpoint. All right, so far so good. All right, the way Genesis is going to work from 12 to 50 is Abraham... I have in parentheses where Abraham's life is. Uh, Abraham kind of shows up in chapter 11 and dies in chapter 25. But the focus of the book on Abraham is really from chapters 12 to 23. So there's a little bit of overlap. Uh, the spotlight, the focus in the center stage on Abraham is 12 to 23, even though he goes from 11 to 25 in the book. Uh, same with the other patriarchs, uh, Isaac, uh, goes from chapters 21 to 35, but the spotlight's on him mainly uh, in 24 and 26, and really more in 26 and 24. Jacob, Jacob is there from chapter 25 to 49. The focus is on him at both ends and a fair amount uh, early on. So Jacob's uh, the center of attention, 25, 27 to 36, and 49. And then the 12 sons of Jacob are kind of the main actors from 29 to, or, or, or there, I'm sorry, are, the, are there from 29 to 50. But they're the main actors in just a couple places. Uh, well, Judah is the main actor in one chapter. And then Joseph is the main actor uh, from chapter 37, uh, 39, 48, and then at the end of 50. So if you crunch all this up, the focus on these patriarchs breaks down as follows. You got basically uh, a Genesis is 50 chapters, so basically a quarter of Genesis is about the Garden of Eden, Noah's Flood, Tower of Babel, all that prehistory stuff. Then you've got the, the, the four generations here, and really the focus is on Abraham for about a quarter of the book, on Jacob for about a quarter of the book, and on Joseph for about a quarter of the book. Just one little glancing chapter on uh, Judah and just a couple little glancing chapters on Isaac. So Isaac's really kind of the forgotten patriarch. The formula goes, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but really, as far as Genesis is concerned, it's the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph. They're where the real action is. Yeah, Jimmy. And the isn't the Judah chapter also where he's not entirely in control himself, primarily, to, it's kind of more on his daughter-in-law? Yeah, Tamar, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, Tamar is... Okay big person in that. And just so y'all know, when I have this screen up, I can only see about four or five of y'all. Uh, so if you have any, any other questions, don't just raise your hand, but uh, holler out and I'll, I'll break there. So any questions about kind of the overview here? Good deal. 
Well, in these, in these, uh, oh, sorry, Jim, I, please, please drop. Uh, I, they mentioned in the book that there's very little known about, very little about Isaac. And as, as we see there, what's the explanation? You know, to me, I always think of Isaac, uh, you know, in, a, in family systems, the middle child is often the one that gets passed over. The focus is on the oldest and the youngest. Uh, in families, middle children often have uh, hang-ups because of that. I think in some ways we got a similar dynamic here. Uh, the the action really is for Abraham and for Jacob and for Joseph and for whatever reason, uh, Isaac is not heavily mentioned. I also think, and, and this is just a pure guess, but perhaps after that attempted sacrifice of Isaac, the the relationship between him and Abraham maybe may have been strained. Isaac may be, may have been traumatized, yeah. maybe some PTSD, who knows? Uh, that's just a complete and total guess. The text doesn't give us that, but that, that, that could be part of it. So, uh, but that, that is, that is one of the, and that is one of the questions though. And the formula preserves them, as I said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but uh, the text doesn't reflect that importance for him. Good question. Uh, yes. I was going to, say perhaps perhaps the moms are considered important maybe not at the time the events alleged to have happened but maybe by the time the the Torah was being written or shortly thereafter by then Judaism was a matrilineal and still is a matrilineal uh, culture and, and so who your mother is is important and that that certainly figures into the text quite quite a bit and again, it is rather odd. These, these women do appear a lot more than they would in other sources from other cultures uh, parallel to this. It is, we, we read it and my gosh, the, uh, the emphasis is on the men. Uh, well, yes, yeah, on the men, it's, it's a patriarchal world, but the amazing thing is how much is on the matriarchs in, in that culture. It is astounding, astoundingly. Radically feminist in that culture uh, to the nth degree as far as, uh, as far as comparison to others around them. Okay, well, we talked about source, sources for the Torah, uh, the different layers, J being the oldest, uh, E and D and P being more recent sources. Uh, Trey, did, did you have your hand up or? No, I was waving it. Okay, uh, I, I'm not gonna say much about that. Really, most scholars think that most of this chunk of Genesis really is heavily J. Jay is kind of an epic story in some ways, and this is great family epic here. And so most scholars attribute most of this to Jay. They, they look at uh, places in Northern Israel, where the E tradition comes from, the, the Northern part of David's kingdom. There, there are a lot of place names from the North that are kind of dropped in here and there. And that seems to be an important contribution from the E writer. And then the P writer uh, looks like they have some contributions, especially around covenant and genealogies and circumcisions, which were all issues that were important to the, the priests. Uh, circumcision was important, the covenant with God was important, and keeping, keeping track of genealogies was important. So those, those additions are in there, most scholars think, but mainly this is Jay providing the broad framework, the broad narrative in this section of Genesis. All right, there are several large themes in this uh, part of Genesis. And one of them is the theme of promise and covenant. Promises made to Abraham and his descendants and a covenant which is an agreement uh, between God and these people. And covenant is a two-way agreement. Uh, there are different kinds of covenants and this one's an uneven covenant. This is a covenant between a king and vassals. This is not an even covenant between friends or brothers. It is a, a king to subject or a suzerain to vassal, as they call it in the literature, kind of covenant that is brought up over and over again in the book of Genesis. But God has a role to play and Abraham has a role to play. And people sometimes ask about covenants. They're more than just a, a loose agreement. They, they're, they're much more binding. And in fact, I kind of do this uh, kind of handshake as a symbol. Uh, if you let go, the covenant still stands kind of unless both of you, both of you really are letting go. 
And if you let go for long enough, the other person may say, okay, the heck with you. But the, there is kind of a, a mutuality in the covenant. It's, it's different than just, you know, we're, we're lightly touching, but we're really, we're really putting ourselves in relationship with each other here. So this covenant is made with, with Abraham and his descendants by God. And, and the promises made in conjunction with that covenant are promises of land, promised land, homeland, the nation of what, what we would call the nation of Israel, promises of descendants, and promises of blessings. But as we go through Genesis, part of the, the narrative tension in Genesis is that all of these promises are threatened in different ways at different times. There are times when it looks like, how are they going to hang on to the land? Do they even own the land? They don't own squat. Well, how, how can God say they have the land? These people, these families have been barren. How can, how can they have descendants? Uh, also, there are three episodes, two with Abraham, one with Isaac, when a, a, a pharaoh or a king was lusting after Sarah or Rebecca, depending on the story, and you're wanting to, wanting to take them into their harem, uh, make them their wives. So if, if you take uh, the, the matriarch out of the system, how are you going to have descendants through that matriarch? So there are threats there as well. There are also threats of death to these descendants, and how, how will they get through get through all those difficulties. And there also are uh, threats to the blessings. Is, is God really blessing them if, if things are not going so well in their lives? And as we go through Genesis, uh, land is something there. They're promised this land, and yet they move into it, and then they move out of it, then they move back into it, then back out of it again, then back into it, then back out of it. There's this back and forth direction through the promised land. In fact, in chapter 12, Abraham is told to leave Haran, go to Canaan. This is the land God's going to give you. And then basically the very next verse, you know, right? He gets there. And then the next thing that happens, there's a famine and they got to go to Egypt, which is not reliant on rainfall. It relies on the flooding of the Nile for its fertility. So whereas the rest of the Fertile Crescent is very susceptible to lack of rain and drought, Egypt is drought proof. There's no rain in Egypt for the most part, but the Nile does provide growth. And so it's very, very consistent. So there's a threat to the land right off the bat. They get here and then they have to go to Egypt. And then they eventually get back, but Abraham sends a servant off to Haran to pick up a wife for his son from the extended family. Jacob later has to escape to Haran and hide out there for a number of years because uh, he's done some bad, bad things to his brother Esau. And Esau, and Esau is kind of a violent guy. So, uh, so Jacob has to flee off there. Then he comes back. And then Jacob's son goes off to Egypt, Joseph. And eventually the whole family gets down to Egypt at the end of the book. And so the book will end with basically the whole family in Egypt. So how can we say this is the promised land if, if they're back and forth in and out? So that's, that's part of the threat and the narrative of Genesis. Does somebody have a question there? Is that just a side side noise? Okay. So going into and out of that land in both directions. Also the blessings, there's a, a double directionality, a bi-directionality to the blessings. The blessings are supposed to be for Abraham and his descendants, but by those blessings, through that blessing, they are also supposed to be a blessing to the other peoples of the world. And in some ways, that's one of the great themes of the entire Old Testament. And it's a theme that the people forget over and over again. God's just not picking you out to show favoritism to you, but God is showing favoritism to you so that you in turn can be of benefit to the entire world, so that you can show the entire world who this God is, what being in relationship with this God is like. And so there's a, a double directionality there that's sometimes forgotten in, in this book. So themes of promise and covenant. So far so good? I have a question, Jim. This sure. is Abby. Hey, Abby. The deal with these blessings, you think once you're blessed, you're blessed. Mm -hmm. But then they keep having to prove themselves to get blessed. And they'll get blessed. And then once again, they've got to prove that they're worthy. Is it really a blessing if you've got to prove yourself time and again? That's, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think of uh, marriage, though. 
you, you proclaim your love in a marriage, but you, you don't stop saying I love you the, the day, of, day of the wedding and then skip out on that for the rest of your life with your spouse. That's something that has to be renewed, something that you, you have to grow in love. And I think there's, there's a piece of that with this relationship with God. Plus, we've got successive generations here. And so it's important not only for Abraham to be in a relationship with God, but that gets renewed with Jacob very heavily, Isaac to a much lesser degree. But there's a double, a tri actually a triple renewal with Jacob. And so, and then there's God's relationship with Joseph. And so, in some ways, each generation has to discover and rediscover God and what being in relationship with God means in their life. The, uh, okay. The, the, the other piece, though, and this is, this is a tough part, and it comes up much more later, the, the Deuteronomic writer, the, the D-layer, which we don't really get much of here, they have a very much of an if-then if sense of being in relationship with God. If you keep my covenant, then I will bless you. If you don't, uh, you're out of luck, and uh, you're going to be, I'll, I'll, I'll withdraw my blessing from you, and you're going to be at the mercy of all the neighbors around you. And so later in scripture, that's a heavy theme that we'll see repeated many, many, many times. In fact, you know, the Deuteronomic writers, you know, the, the blessing uh, gets withdrawn uh, eventually to the point where Babylon comes in and conquers Jerusalem. You can't just do anything, y'all. You, need to, need to, you need to hang on to God just as much as God wants to hang on to you. And if you let go of God for a while, God may uh, let you drift and experience the consequences of that. So there, there is that that complexity there. I think God's love for his people is there the whole time, but it, it's, it's not as simplistic as we might like. So that's, a, that's a great question. Jim, I have a kind of a side comment on their, um, the, the Jews or, or Hebrews being blessed to be a blessing to others. I've seen a documentary um, a couple of times, not recently, but it's based on current Trend, things that are going on now in Syria and around the world. And there, the documentary is about the Israeli people. And these are the Hebrews. We're not talking Christians. Mm -hmm. But they, they believe that they need to help these Syrians that have been um, seeking asylum and trying to get to other countries. And there were medical doctors and nurses and people leading teams of other, you know, groups that were helping them as they were leaving Syria. And that was their thing of we are we are to help other people. And they have some incredible scientists and researchers in Israel that share their information, you know, that are, they've been, they were working, they had stuff on the coronavirus because of the, um, the bird flu, the one that was back, you know, 10, 15, I mean, they were already doing research on all of that and vaccines and all of that to share with the world. You know, they're, that's kind of how they see themselves even today. It's still part of their who they are. Right. They want to be a blessing to others. And to be yeah. fair, the, those are groups within Judaism. There are other groups that say we need to, you know, have our, our borders up and protect ourselves. Yes. And the the rest of the world can kind of go off and do its own thing. You know. So this is a, a tension in Judaism. We are supposed to be a blessing to others. How are we going to do that? And there's a tension that there are certainly groups like you're describing that are very much mm -hmm. that, that grab onto that. The prophets also grab onto that a lot and say, this is your purpose. You've forgotten it. Get back to it. You need to be a blessing to others. Don't forget that. Good, good. A couple other themes. I uh, won't spend much time on this. There is some etiology, some things that explain why things are the way they are, especially in Genesis, why there are shrines set up in certain locations, especially some locations in the north of Israel. That's something the E writer uh, puts in quite a bit. Also, there is some descriptions of why and, and where the neighbors come from. Where are the Edomites coming from? Where are the Mo Moabites coming from? Well, there's some explanations in Genesis of this is where these neighboring countries, these neighboring tribes stem from. So stem from. So we have some etiology there. Uh, and I, I put there, you know, Lot is the, the father of the Ammonites and the Moabites, uh, Esau, the Edomites, and Hagar and Ishmael are and Keturah, to a lesser extent, are the ancestors of the Arabic peoples. And on the map, just in case you don't have it memorized, Am Ammon is right across the Jordan, uh, Moab's across the Jordan and the Dead Sea, Edom is down here in the south. So what we would call the nation state of Jordan 
is is where these tribes eventually end up, and they do stem. They're 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 cousins, distant relatives of the people of of Israel. They are they are uh, they are fellow descendants of Abraham, or in the case of the Ammonites and Moabites, uh, descendants of Terah, Abraham's dad. So they're their relatives. In fact, one of the one of the circumlocutions that you sometimes say in the Middle East is you don't want to say you're my cousin because that implies you're a relative, but you're a son of my uncle. Uh, I acknowledge that there is some relationship, but you're not a close relative. Uh, you're the son of my uncle. So uh, that's kind of an insulting way of saying uh, that we, we share common ancestry, but you know, not we're not that that tight. Son of my uncle. All right, there are also in Genesis some heavy themes of some family dynamics, and I would say also in our language today, family dysfunction. There are two overarching themes of favoritism and deception that are intrinsic in this family of Abraham and his descendants. There's often a, a preference for one child over the other, favoritism, and there also is deception that goes on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and his brothers all engage in deception in various ways. In fact, uh, there are some that there, Jacob is one of the, the great deceivers. He's a, a, a great uh, a, a champion deceiver, and he meets up with his uncle, who's also a champion deceiver, and we have an Olympics of family deception going on between Jacob and his uncle Laban later on in Genesis. So that's very much a part of the story. But having said that, not only is there favoritism in a negative way, and it does cause problems when the father likes one child over the other or the mother likes one child over the others. It does cause family issues. But there's also that sense, too, that God will often choose to work through the youngest or next to youngest uh, child, in the case of Jacob, that God also opts for working with these, uh, with certain ancestors and not with others with certain members of the family and not with others. And this is also countercultural. In their world, the oldest son had all the rights, all the privileges, got a double portion of the property. And yet God works with the unlikelier descendants oftentimes. And this will also continue all the way down. And the King David saga, David is the youngest son of Jesse. This, this is something that will continue later on. So God will often, for whatever reasons, choose to work through people that are not uh, the, the natural leader that we would expect, the oldest, oldest son. The other thing, too, uh, deception, we, we see deception as purely negative, and in some ways it is. They're, they're lying to each other and trying to trick each other. On the other hand, in their culture, it also is a, a sign of shrewdness or wisdom or cleverness. There's also almost a trickster quality. Uh, Norse mythology has Loki, the great trickster god, and that's important in the Norse Norse uh, mythology. Native American cultures will often have trickster uh, type stories, and those are very important also. And, and so there's an element in this where actually, well, yeah, he did a bad, bad thing, but my, didn't he pull it off great? Uh, isn't it cool the way he did that? Yeah, he shouldn't have done that, but wow, uh, he was so sharp to do it that way. So even, even in the Gospels, when they're trying to trap Jesus, there's often a sign of how brilliant and clever Jesus is. Next week, we got the gospel lesson about the coin. You know, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus says, show me a coin whose picture is on it, Caesar's. Well, give it to Caesar. Uh, and to God, give the things that are God. So there's, there's a shrewdness in Jesus that is valued in those kind of cultures as well. So that's a piece of, piece of all this. All right, there's also a theme of new identities, new names. You've got uh, Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarai becoming Abraham and Sarah instead of just father, becoming father of a multitude, which is what Abraham means. Abram is a great father, but Abraham is father of multitudes. Uh, Jacob, the one who supplants, becomes Israel, the, the one who struggles with God. Uh, it's a much bigger, bigger name he gets. And Joseph gets the name uh, Zephenath Panea, which is one of those Bible trivia questions. What's, what's Joseph's Egyptian name? Zephenath Panea, of course. They don't use it much in scripture, but there, there is an Egyptian identity that he gains. So there, there are new identities, and these identities all are indicative of new relationships and deeper relationships with God, in the first two cases with, with uh, Pharaoh, in the, in the last 
last one here. Okay, so far so good. But that's kind of the, 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 the 10,000 foot view. But I did want to just really quickly run through the narrative itself. We've got 38 chapters here. It's, it's one of the great treasures of, the Saga of Abraham is really one of the great works of Western literature, Western civilization, even though it's actually Asian, uh, it has come into the Western, Western literary canon. And so you'll read it sometime. It's, 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 we, we don't have time to do it justice at all. In fact, we've studied Genesis in great detail in years past, and it's a tremendous story. Real quick, what the overarching themes are. So Abraham, the Saga of Abraham especially, he's center stage for 12 of the chapters. And I, I slap down what happens here. It's much quicker than we can uh, deal with. But in chapter 12, Abraham is called to leave his homeland in Iraq slash northern Syria and go to Canaan, the promised land. And as soon as he gets there, as I said, there's a famine. He's got to go to Egypt. And Pharaoh wants Sarah as his wife. And Abraham has to lie to Pharaoh. He says, she's my sister. And then uh, things don't turn out so great for Pharaoh. Pharaoh actually pays Abraham a nice bribe to, to leave. And so Abraham makes money off the deal. Uh, deception. Uh, it, it's not just Jacob and later generations. Abraham, right off the bat, one of the first stories we have is him deceiving Pharaoh and benefiting materially from it. Chapter 13, he gets back to Canaan. Uh, he and his nephew Lot work out a way of splitting where they're going to run their sheep. Uh, if I run my sheep on this side of the river, you can run them on the other side of the river. Which, which, which side do you want? And Abraham gives his nephew first choice. So Lot is, Lot is there. Chapter 14 narrates some battles with some of the local warlords. Uh, there's also a blessing from the king of Salem, which will later be Jerusalem. Not a Jewish city at this point. Won't be a Jewish city until King David's time. But there is a blessing by Melchizedek, who would be a Bible trivia question if it were not for the fact that the epistle to the Hebrews views Melchizedek as a very important lens through which we view who Jesus Christ is. And so Melchizedek would probably be just a footnote if it wasn't for the fact that Hebrews and the New Testament really heavily center on identifying Jesus through this, this figure of Melchizedek. Chapter 15, there is a renewal of the covenant, uh, a furtherance of the covenant, a greater explication of the covenant, promise of descendants, promise of land, and there's an appearance by God at night. They, they divide some animals. The, the idea was you would cut animals in half, and then you would pass through it, you and the uh, other member of the other party to the covenant, in order to say, if, if I break the covenant, may I be sliced in half like these animals are. Well, that night, God, in an appearance of fire, goes through the midst of these two animals, really kind of cementing in their cultural terms this covenant with Abraham. But right after being promised that, that he's going to have descendants, Abraham and Sarah say, well, we're old and, and things are not going well. We're not having any descendants. Sarah's old and barren. Abraham's old. And so Sarah gives her slave girl, an Egyptian named Hagar, to, to Abraham. This is a theme that happens throughout Scripture. God makes a promise, but it ain't coming true on our timetable, so let's force God's hand or let's try to take matters into our own hands. And that's what they do. And it usually causes problems in the long run. And it does in this case. A son, Ishmael, is born to Abraham. But uh, Sarah makes Hagar's life miserable. Hagar runs off in the wilderness. But there, remarkably, talk about women. Uh, God appears to Hagar in the wilderness. The Egyptian, not even part of this direct lineage of Abraham as far as where the, the covenant and the Jewish people are going to be. And he's also her God as well. And she calls him El, El Roy, the, the God who sees, which is an amazing thing. So God is also caring for these descendants as well. Chapter 17, Abraham, Abram gets the new name of Abraham. They, they have a renewed covenant uh, promise again. And God also says, as a mark of that covenant, let's start circumcising your males. Now, Abraham is up in his 90s at this point. But he circumcises himself, his servants, his entourage, his son Ishmael, they all are circumcised as a mark of the covenant. Chapter 18, God pays a visit to the tent of Abraham. This is the great uh, Yahweh's J story. God is intimate. God 
shows up at Abraham's tent with a couple of angels is how we read it. Christians might say, well, maybe it's a Trinitarian appearance, three visitors coming to a tent. Hmm, hmm, hmm. In fact, the Russian Orthodox icon of the Trinity is these three angels appearing at Abraham's tent. But the Jewish folks would regard it as God with two angels. They, they show up at his tent. Abraham lavishes hospitality on him. They promise him a son, not through Hagar, but through Sarah. Uh, and the son will be born within a year, they say. And uh, Sarah laughs. And so later when that son is born, they name him Laughter. Sarah laughs, ha, as if that's going to happen, but God has the last laugh. Also, God is wanting to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in our culture, this is way more than we have time to talk about. Uh, it's been used as a uh, discussion of whether or not God approves of homosexual behavior or not. That's not what the story's about. It's uh, about whether God approves of gang rape of your guest. Uh, and so, Homosexuality can be a different different discussion, but you don't want to base any kind of theories on it on the Sodom and Gomorrah story. In fact, later in the scripture, when it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, that is not what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is. It's nothing, nothing uh, like we've been using it. Just like we used Ham to excuse slavery in the antebellum South, that story has been misused also. In fact, the word sodomy is under our language, uh, unfortunately, because of that story. So it's, it's a bad reading. But Abraham bargains, if you can find, uh, you know, 40 righteous people, will you spare it? God says, yeah, if you find, you know, 30, find 20, will you spare it? If, I, if you only find 10, will you spare it? And God says, yes, but they can't even find that many. So in the next chapter, angels do go. Uh, they do get Lot, Abraham's nephew, out of town safely, but Lot and his family are it. And so destruction rains down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot escapes, but his wife is turned to a pillar of salt. Not enough time to go into that. Chapter 20, there's almost a repeat of chapter 12. Abraham lies about who Sarah is, whether she's his wife or not, uh, and claims she's his sister to this local king, warlord Abimelech. And again, deception going on here. Again, it's a threat to the covenant, but Again, uh, everything works out well in the end. Chapter 21, Sarah does give birth to Isaac. And as Isaac is growing up, Hagar and Ishmael get banished. There's some jealousy. There may be some suggested abuse of Ishmael on Isaac. And depends on how you read the story. Uh, but for whatever reason, Ishmael and Hagar are banished. And they go out in the desert and they almost die of thirst, but God provides for them. The Hajj. In Mecca, every year, every year that Muslims are supposed to go on once in their lifetime, they recreate this story. This is very important to their idea of who they are as Abraham's descendants, that God provided for Ishmael and Hagar in the wilderness. They, they go through, they run back and forth as Hagar ran back and forth looking for water. And so anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Don't have time to go into all the details of that. Then chapter 22, we have the famous test of Abraham with the attempted sacrifice of Isaac. As we talked about before, this is only a test is probably one way of reading it. Also, there may be some etiology. This is why Jews don't practice child sacrifice, because God said it's not necessary. So much more we could say about that. Uh, can't really do much more except by title. Chapter 23, Abraham has promised this land, and yet he's a nomadic shepherd this whole time. But in chapter 23, he buys one little tiny chunk of land down in the south near Hebron, a little cave to bury his, to have a family plot, basically. And so he, he has deed to one little tiny chunk of the promised land, which he uses as a burial cave for his, his family. So I'm going to have to go into a little faster overdrive here. So that's the Abraham saga in brief. The Isaac saga, only two chapters, really. The, when the, the focus is on him, and much of the focus in chapter 24 isn't even on Isaac. It's on Abraham's servant going back to find Rebecca, Isaac's wife. And it's a lovely, lovely story uh, how God is involved in helping him find Rebecca. And it's actually very sweet at the end when Isaac sees her as love at first sight. Uh, he, he's very thrilled with, with Rebecca and is, is comforted by his relationship with her after his mother's death.
Chapter 25, in the middle of the Isaac saga, as if the Isaac saga is not brief enough, there is uh, the next generation already intruding. Uh, Abraham died. The last generation intrudes. Abraham dies. The next generation is born. Esau and Jacob, twins. And Esau grows up and trades his birthright for some stew because he was out hunting and he's hungry. Chapter 26, we get one more Isaac story. And it's just like Abraham and Pharaoh and Abraham and Elimelech. Uh, Isaac also lies about who Rebecca is, whether she's his sister or his wife. So uh, another near, another parallel there, but very glancing relationship with Isaac. Jacob uh, takes up a good chunk of the narrative, uh, a quarter of the narrative in Genesis. We saw Jacob already getting his birthright from Esau for uh, some red stew. And by the way, the Edomites, Edom means red. And so they traded those are the red people with a red-haired ancestor who traded their birthright for red stew. So there's kind of some uh, play on words there. But Jacob also, under the tutelage of his mother, he's mama's favorite and Esau is daddy's favorite, favoritism in the family. Jacob impersonates Esau, puts on animal skins on his arms and his neck so he can be hairy because his dad's getting blind, but his dad feels his neck. Says, well, it sounds like Jacob, but you know the arms are the arms of Esau, they're hairy. and so. Esau tricks his dad into giving him the blessing of the older son, which is the bigger blessing. And Esau doesn't get it, and Esau's livid. Uh, Jacob is sent off to Hebron also to, to find a wife because they don't want him marrying a local girl like Esau does. On the way to Hebron, running away, he stops at a place that's later called Bethel. He sees a vision. Jacob's ladder really is more of a stairway or a pyramid, a ziggurat up to heaven. Angels and angels ascending and descending. God is active, sending emissaries back and forth between heaven and earth. They're not separate. They are connected, and God is active both directions. Jacob gets there, finds Uncle Laban, uh, falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. Laban uh, tricks Jacob into working for him and then slips in the other daughter, the older daughter, Leah, on the wedding night. They, Jacob's upset. He also marries Rachel. Uh, and agrees to work longer. They, they have many children. Uh, there's some, a lot of rivalry between the two sisters, and they also bring their, their handmaids in. And so these four women, the two sisters and their two servants, give birth to the, the 12 uh, sons of Jacob plus some daughters. And Rachel is still the favorite wife, though, favoritism. And her son, Joseph, becomes Jacob's favorite. Joseph will have a baby brother later that Rebecca dies in childbirth. Uh, Rachel dies in childbirth, and Benjamin is Jacob's second favorite son, but Joseph really is his, his favorite. Uh, Jacob also does some shrewd animal husbandry, increases his flock. Jacob says, okay, Jacob and Laban agree that you know, I'll have the spotted animals and you, you, the white animals are yours, and so Jacob selectively breeds and increases the, the spotted and the black sheep and goats. And uh, Anyway, he gets out of Dodge eventually. They sneak off. Laban pursues him. Uh, even, even the daughters, uh, Rachel steals Laban's household gods. There's kind of a, I don't have much time, but there's kind of a joke. She, she hides them under, under herself while they're searching the tents. And he says, move so I can search here. Oh, I'm, I'm menstruating, basically. And so there's a little joke. These household gods of the, of the neighbors are something that could be hidden by a menstruating woman, which is kind of an insult. Uh, so it's a little dig at the other gods of other cultures. Jacob comes back home. Uh, Esau is approaching. Jacob gets very nervous that night. He is very nervous, and an angel or God appears and wrestles with him till daybreak. The, the angel or God gives him a new name, Israel, and also gives him a limp for the rest of his life. Jacob is reunited with Esau. Esau doesn't kill him. In fact, Esau says, you know, brother, I've got lots of flocks. I don't need your stuff. Uh, can you come home with me? Jacob says, well, go on, and I'll catch up to you later. They never really catch up. They do get together to bury their dad, Isaac, later on, but that they're never close, never close. Uh, chapter 34, Jacob's daughter is raped. Uh, the brothers Simeon and Levi avenge her. Uh, it's this kind of a brutal story. Chapter 35, uh, God renews the covenant with Jacob a, a third time at Bethel. He also did it here and here. And there are some genealogies in chapter 36. So that's the, the, the bulk of the Jacob saga, even though he'll be around until the very next to the last chapter of Genesis.
And then real quick, the, the Joseph saga. Um, this is one of the great, the Joseph saga itself is also one of the great short stories within one of the great stories of Western literature. It's, it's a musical with uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber for good reason. It's a great, great, great story. Uh, Joseph is the favorite. He's got a coat with long sleeves. His dad gave him not many colors, long sleeves, which meant you don't do work. You can't have long sleeves and do work. Uh, the brothers are jealous of him. They sell him into slavery. They lie to Jacob. Jacob the deceiver gets deceived by his sons. Uh, what goes around comes around. They tell him Jake, Joseph's dead. Kill an animal, fake the death, blood, all that. There is an episode, an interlude with brother Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar. Uh, I don't have really time to get into that, but Tamar turns out to be one of Jesus's ancestors in Matthew's genealogy. A wonderful, interesting figure there. Joseph gets to Egypt. He rises in Potiphar's house, then gets falsely accused of rape. He's thrown in jail, but there's some servants of Pharaoh in jail. Joseph interprets their dreams. Pharaoh has some dreams. Joseph is let out to interpret those. Pharaoh makes him number two in Egypt. And then there's a famine. The brothers come to try to get some grain from Egypt, and Joseph tests them. The test is basically, how are they going to treat their youngest brother, Benjamin? And they will be willing to die or be in prison rather than have Benjamin uh, be punished. And so they'll put themselves in the place of their youngest baby brother, which is not what they did with Joseph. They, they sold Joseph into slavery, but they're worried about their dad now, and they don't want to break his heart again. And so it shows they've changed. There's a wonderful family reunion. Uh, Joseph reunites with his brothers. Jacob and the entire family move down to Egypt. They go back. They bring dad and all their wives and kids come to Egypt. They live in Egypt. Jacob blesses Pharaoh, uh, and Joseph amasses more wealth and land for Pharaoh. And then in chapter 48, Jacob blesses Joseph's son. But as he's got the, the Joseph arranges them so the older son's under Jacob's right hand. And the younger son is under Jacob's left hand, and Jacob switches them before the blessing. Younger is favored over the older, yet again with Joseph's sons. Chapter 49 is really the focus back on Jacob for one last chapter. He gives a final blessing and a final prophecy about each of his sons. And then in the last chapter of Genesis, the brothers take Jacob's mummified body back to Israel, back to bury in that cave at Hebron, that family plot. And then they come back to Egypt, and they're afraid of Joseph. And Joseph says, you know, you did bad things to me, but God intended it for good. So don't worry. I'm not going to take revenge now that dad's dead. But when I die, please make sure I eventually get back to the, the promised land. And they will take his mummified body back centuries later when the exodus happens. And so that's the, the broad outlines of the saga of Genesis. Way too quick for three quarters of the book here. Questions or thoughts? Uh, again, it's a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous story. So please, uh, always, it's, it's a great thing to read through. Uh, Jim, I've got a question from the back a bit. When Abraham and I guess it was uh, Isaac were saying that their wives, telling the kings that their wives were their sisters, why was that? Would they not kill their sisters, but would have taken their wives? Or why that, did they have to? That, that was exactly it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the reason she's in my entourage is she's my sister. Well, Sarah may actually have been a half-sister of Abraham. And Rebecca was certainly a cousin of Isaac, so they were related. So it was kind of true. But the, 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 yeah, the reason was the, the king wanted them in the harem. And the, the only way to really get a wife into your harem was to kill the husband. And so this was Abraham and Isaac saving their own skins. The, okay. the kids were unhappy to find out they were married and gave the wives back in, in all cases, instead of killing the husbands, which they could have done, I guess. And in a couple of cases, they gave them more money, which, which increased the wealth of the family. So, But it, but it seems uh, like the, pardon me, it seems though like the women are being sold into prostitution. Well, there is some of that. And again, let's say this is a patriarchal culture. And you know, Tamar, Tamar actually uh, has to pose as a prostitute with her father-in-law, Judah, in order to secure an, an heir for her dead husband. And she's doing the right thing, actually. And, and so there are some complex sexual dynamics here. But again, it is a patriarchal culture. What's remarkable is not that the women are being treated badly, 
but that the women are much more players in salvation history than they are in other cultures. So we, we always have to stipulate the, the women are, do not have a high place in this culture. They are often objectified. They're often used as pawns in various things. But given the rest of the culture, the Jewish people are positively radical feminists for their day 3,500 years ago. Questions or thoughts, other questions or thoughts here? I, Father Jim. Yes. The, the figure on page 69 of the, the traditional, the tomb of Abraham, the tomb of the, of the forefathers and foremothers. Yes. You know, is there some, and obviously nobody's going to open them up and see if there's actually somebody there who's buried in Grant's tomb type of thing. But is there, is there any argument that it's not the burial place? No, you know, this is, this is a, an ancient site, and both Muslims and Jews revere this site. It's actually in Hebron, which is a very, uh, you, you, can't, you can't go see these tombs on the standard tour of Israel right now because this has been part of nastiness going on, riots and things for decades. And so Hebron's not a very safe place to go visit. My uncle actually got to, but I, I did not. Uh, he, he timed it just right and was one of the few uh, Americans that got to go down there on the package tour because that's very rare to go down there. But this, there is some conflict between Jews and Muslims over this too, but they do revere this as the, as the place. Whether it is or not, uh, could be, that's, these are ancient things lost in antiquity, but that's a good question, Bob. Jim, um, yes. Uh, I was interested in Kierkegaard's conclusion that you should uh, follow the dictate of God, even though the dictate is against your idea of what is moral and right. Well, how is it that he came to that conclusion? Especially about Kierkegaard. Wow. Okay. Um, yes, it's about the binding of Isaac. Of Isaac. Yeah, I, th I think. Part, part of that is we, in our, our humanity, our humanity it understands less than, than God's will at, at times. And so for Kierkegaard, as I understand it, and I'm not hugely up on his moral theology, but that we, we need to lean, lean toward obedience instead of trying to rely on our own brains exclusively. We need to think, certainly, he would say, but if push comes to shove, if God's ways are different than what we would intrinsically think is correct, then we need to lean towards what God would have us do and not what our own human predilections would do. But that binding of Isaac is one of the toughest, toughest things to deal with theologically in, in the book of Genesis, no doubt. The, 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 best, the best thing I would say about that is Abraham, uh, God spared Abraham's son Isaac. God did not spare his own son Jesus. Uh, God went through with uh, giving a son up on behalf of the world. And so God is willing to do more for us than he expects of us to do. Uh, but that is a hugely complex, complex thing. And there's all kinds of stuff in the church fathers and the rabbis uh, in, you know, like you say, all the way up through 20th century figures like Kierkegaard. It's, it's, a, it's a thorny, thorny problem. Not, not one that's easy to sort out in the neat categories. But to me, but, I, bottom line is it's a test, and God does stop the test. He, he wants to see it Abraham's willing, but does not want him to kill his son. So. Dan, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Jamie. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, on a historical note, though, I think you mentioned it, but a lot of the neighboring groups would actually sacrifice their children, though, too. Oh, good. So, no, I... I I stood at Megiddo, and Megiddo, before it became a Jewish city, you know, they, they were talking about all the baby baby and child skeletons they dug up, and some of the babies are a little too soft to be preserved archaeologically. But, oh, yeah. Child sacrifice out the wazoo back in the early days. That was a so, very common thing all the neighbors practiced. Uh, the god Moloch, uh, who was a big god in the Canaanite pantheon, was worshipped by child sacrifice. Uh, nasty. Uh, so this, this, is, this does set the Jewish people apart. Uh, they don't they don't sacrifice their children they do offer them to god 
Mm -hmm. They dedicate them to God. Then they offer a sacrifice to God to buy the children back. Mm -hmm. In fact, Jesus is taken to the temple for just that same ceremony in, in Luke chapter 2. And his parents sacrifice a couple pigeons to oh. doves to bring him, bring him back. Becky, yeah. You had a question? Uh, yeah, just quickly. Am I wrong in thinking that the, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not sodomy or homosexuality, but was rather the lack of hospitality? to neighbors and to others and that's, I mean, that's kind of broad brush of it yeah it is broad brush but yeah i mean and and the 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 the, the unhospitable behavior was going to manifest itself by gang rape uh and so you know certainly sexual stuff is brought in with that but no to treat a guest like that is absolutely reprehensible across across cultures in the middle east treating a guest correctly was of huge importance in every culture. And so this was just abominable behavior to, to want to do that to a guest of someone else in your town uh, was hideous. Uh, and Lot was going to offer up his daughters to... And Lot, Lot, Lot offered his daughters. Uh, again, Abby's question about, you know, these women are kind of treated badly. Yeah, they are. Uh, Lot, it was preferable for Lot to have his daughters raped than to have his guests raped. Uh, and, that's that's a whole nother whole nother discussion, but unfortunately we're we're past time. But go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. No, 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 it's all right. Never mind. Yeah. No, I've 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 got I've got a few minutes if nobody else is got, go ahead. Well immediately before the Sodom and Gomorrah where where you have the blessing of the blessing of Sarah that she'd have children, where Abraham shows his hospitality. Right. It's so it's it's God and two angels there and then god sticks behind sticks and, and dickers with abraham over how many how many righteous people in sodom is it going to take the angels go on right the angels go down to sodom and gomorrah to do their business yes yeah, yeah. take it take take care of their side job uh is the am i correct that god and the two angels in this in this segment are frequently portrayed as the Trinity. That that is that is the way, especially in Orthodox iconography. The, the great, the great uh, picture of the Trinity. I've got one above my desk here. Hang on. Um, the great. This is a uh, kind of like those Last Suppers by Da Vinci. They're repainted. This is a repainting of. Uh, I'll try to keep the glare off the glass. This is Rublev's Trinity with God, uh, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, at table. It, the, by the Oaks of Memory as Abraham's guests. Uh, I've exegeted this icon before in a sermon. It's a marvelous icon, but yes, Christians see this as maybe a, a proto-Trinitarian manifestation here. But then, then you've got the difficulty of well, which members of the Trinity are going off to off to be angels in Solomon? So that it's a little bit of a stretch for Christians, I think, because of that piece. But it does make it complex. Nonetheless, Jim. it's a great icon. Yes, John. Um, I just, this is off, but he met the, the chapter makes a big deal at the end about the changing of the name of God from El to Yahweh. And why is that important? Is it a different God in the conception? Well, El, El, is, El is a generic name for God that's shared across a lot of the cultures, but Yahweh is a specific name for God that is revealed to the Jewish people as the, their name for their God. And it really, in Exodus, as far as the P writer is concerned, it gets revealed then at the burning bush. The, the, the J writer uses it much earlier in, in uh, the scripture. But it, it does reflect that you know, our God is not just generic. Our God is this specific God who has this specific relationship with us, who's called us in these specific ways to, to, do, uh, to do these things, to follow him. And, be in covenant with him. So, did they specify different characteristics for the generic God and Yahweh? Well, you know, some of it, some of the generic God characteristics certainly bled over. Uh, in Canaanite religion, El is a sky god, a thunder god, uh, and that in Baal turns into a storm god. And so, some of those characteristics, some of the Psalms have God riding the clouds like chariots and uh, sending thunder. Uh, so, there, there is some of that stuff that does that does leak over. God, Yahweh certainly is a sky God in some ways early on. And, and 
remember, and this is much more than we have time for, the Jews at this point are not monotheists. They grow in their monotheism. They are our gods better than your gods, uh, but it'll be a much later stage when they say our God's the only real God. Our God created everything. Your gods are nothing. Uh, our God's the only real God. But they're not at that stage yet. Right now, our God is more powerful. Our God is better. Our God, my father can beat up your father. My God can beat up your God. So. Well, we better stop it there. Uh, we went, went long, but good to see you all. And uh, we'll pick up next week with the book of Exodus. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Jim.